Well, you get to hear from me today. Mark and I are going to share the pulpit. Um, we didn't have any special speaker, and I just thought, well, I'll share. Get to share once in a while on Sunday. But um, the word that the Lord gave me was to talk about the love of God. And in freedom, um, just with our country, the love that people have given to lay down their life for our freedom. And if God could take you on a venture in your mind to see what um, peoples have done for your freedom um, from the time of America just starting until today, I think you'd be on your face. Many people have died. Many people have given their life for your freedom. And so I want to talk about Jesus giving his life for our freedom to set us free in the love of God. And so, um, oh, thanks, Mark. And so the only word that I got from the Lord was the love of God. And so like, okay, well, how do you, how do you learn about the love of God? And, and so I looked into the concordance and I looked at every scripture that said love. And there's thousands of scriptures that say love and loved and loves and lover. But I just stuck to the scripture love. And I started going through each chapter of the Bible and read on what love um, just the word love. So there's there's a lot of dynamics in the word of love. I know love is um, can be an emotion, but we're not to be driven by our emotions. You know, um, I don't. Yesterday I had a testimony, and then I'll go on to my sharing about love. But we did a wedding here, and I sat down on that bench and I started talking to um, an older woman and. I was telling Melissa that I passed the test because I knew the spirit in her wanted to provoke me to start arguing and I wasn't going to do it and I kept really calm and I kept really quiet. But what I didn't know, which Jocelyn, you were in my testimony yesterday, which is really cool. I had asked her where she went to church, and she said she went to a Lutheran church. And I, you know, just went, well, thinking for sure they go to the Lutheran church that doesn't license homos, sexuals. And so I said, well, do you go to, like, the, a Lutheran church that does not believe in, in licensing homosexuals? And she goes, oh, no, oh, no, we believe in it. And I'm like, oh, and I go, and before, I, and I, I probably won't be able to share exactly how the, my witnessing went, but um, I just said, well, before I knew that she had gone to a Lutheran church that licensed homosexuals, I was telling her about a church that just burnt down to the ground three weeks ago. It's probably four weeks ago, right, Jason? About four weeks ago? And they were going through the decision if they were going to license homosexuals in their church or not. And what happened is the Lord hit it with lightning and burnt it down. Well, when the Lutheran church was trying to decide that, there was a tornado that came through the city about three years ago and and wiped out. Did it wipe out the church? The, the steeple. So it's like God, it, like you can ignore all the signs and the wonders in the heavens or whatever, whatever God's trying to get your attention. But what I did not know is that she had a son that was a homosexual. So of course, right away, that's like your red flag. You just like, you know, you're being defensive and you want to, you know, you want to protect your children. And it's sad, you guys. I mean, I think that's a very sad situation. But what's even sadder is when when we go along with it because we want to comfort them instead of taking the stand that no, what your lifestyle is, could you could end up in hell forever and eternity. And not that you want to condemn them, but you want to help them out. And I go, and she goes, no, God just loves these people. She goes, these lesbians and these these homosexuals are not pervert, perverts. And I go, no, they're not. And I'm trying to cut tack really quiet, you know, so I don't get in the argument. And I go, no, but, but the lifestyle is not what God wants. And so, and it's sad, you guys, you can never go by your emotions and your feelings to justify the word of God. And that's kind of what I'm going to talk on today, is the love of God is speaking the truth in love. And it doesn't mean that you, you know, run up to, if you meet a, like, in Jocelyn, I hope you don't mind, but I used you as a testimony yesterday. Is that okay? Can I use you as a testimony? 
thank you. And I just said, you know what, we've got a young girl that came out of that lifestyle and she has been set free and God is like, like um, just bringing her into freedom and, and it's not about female and male, you guys. It's about spirit and that in eternity we're going to live in the spirit. We're not, we're going to get a body but no flesh is going to inherit eternal life. No flesh. Okay, so you can't enter into the kingdom of God in your flesh. You're going to enter in because you're, you've got Christ in you and that you've been delivered from sin and death. And so the love of God is to really speak the truth in love to set the captives free, which it's sad because you know what? Why I'm talking on this too is in Second Peter, it talks about there's going to be false prophets and there's also going to be false teachers in the last days. And they, it says that they are going to have seducing spirits that are going to bring seduction to the church. We need to be so washed in the word that you don't fall aside. And not that, like I, I was a challenge, being a challenge to her because I want her son saved. I want, she said, I hang around with the lesbian and the homosexual community and they, I, they love God and, and, and I love them. And I'm so, yeah, but you know what? Love is not, not telling the truth. Telling the truth is going to set them free. If you're their friend and you're not willing to tell them the truth and they go to hell for eternity, is that love? Is that love, you guys? Now, we're at a wedding and I'm like not looking for this encounter at all. Like, God always like, kind of whips me. But what I can say is that I really handled it with grace. I did not have any anxiety. And Stephanie and Bridget always laugh at me. <laughs> I'm going to have to look at these two. They always smile so big. But I, I kept my composure and I didn't get like strife, you know, like striving with that, her. But I just really wanted to set her free because, you guys, this is her son's eternity. And it's sad, you know, it's sad that, that he's in that lifestyle. And it's sad that any of our kids fall on the wayside. Oh, and then another thing she said to me, she goes, he was born that way genetically. And I go, you are right. He was born that way, but it wasn't genetics. It's called generational curses or spirits that have entered into him that have lied to him since he's been young. And I said, he has believed a lie, so now he's living out that lie. And, and for me, I mean, I'm, you guys, I have one relative that is a homosexual. Matter of fact, our son Josiah is a lawyer, and he works for Mark. I met, and I've had encounters with Mark. I've gotten to share the truth, you know, with him. But I don't, you, you know, we don't want to hurt them, but we want to set them free. And so love is always about setting free. You guys, the love of God is the truth. You need, we need to, you guys, especially in today, we need to get in the word. And don't, you know, I, like with her, I was saying, I'm taking the Lord's side. I'm not taking man's side. I know, I know that, that, um, that many men are convinced, and I'm talking the human race, are convinced that that lifestyle is okay, but it's a lying spirit. And, and they're lying to, this, you know, to the church. So off of that subject, onto the love of God, is telling the truth. And um, it says, we are challenged to love our enemy, bless those that curse us. And I'm just going to go through some scriptures on the love of God. Um, hate and bless those who hate you, and pray for those that use you. You guys, that is so opposite our, our who we are. You know, somebody hurts me, I'm ready to knock them out. You know what I mean? It goes against our nature. Our, but we're to, it says that we're to love our enemy. We're to um, bless those that curse us. And we are to pray for those that use us. And so, I'll give you the scripture. It says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But Jesus said... I'll say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, and do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who use you and persecute you. We are to love the Lord thy God with all your heart. Like I said, I went through scriptures and just looked up the word love. You're to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. You guys, we are to wake up every day and say, you know what, God, you're number one. I'm going to love you with all my heart. I'm going to love you with all my mind. Meaning, if you're going to love God with all your mind, you've got to get into the Word of God, you guys. I witness a lot. I, I do love to witness to people. That's my desire. I just love it. I like it more than eating, probably. Can't tell, but no. Anyways, um, I love witnessing. I do it. And, and you know... You, you got to know the word 
so that you can come at them to set the captives free and, and, and to love them with all your heart. And they know if you're legitimate. You know, you can, I remember a girl witnessing to me and she always said, the Lord, this, the Lord, that. And it never even led me to the Lord, but I think the reason it did not lead me to Jesus was she lived a double life. She lived for herself and was trying to talk to God to me and I couldn't hear her. And after I got saved, I even said that to her. I said, you know what? When you used to witness to me, I couldn't hear you. I couldn't hear what you were saying. And it was because you were living a double life. And that was just when I was a baby. I already got bold in the Lord. But anyways, I literally, you guys, I'll give you a testimony. I was so bold. I got saved. I was a surgical tech at the time. I worked with... Um, the nurses and the anesthesiologists, and I got so on fire for God, and Shelly was only about two and a half years old in a daycare, and I was so on fire for God. My boss told me, she said, Anna, if you witness one more time, I'm going to fire you. I'm like, you can't talk to anybody in here about God. And I'm like, it was so hard because I was so excited. But God told me I had to go talk to the anesthesiologist. And I'm like scared, you guys. Like, I know that this is my job. Okay, if I go in there, I support Shelly. This is my job. I'm going to get fired because Ella was serious. I'm off my notes so well. So I go into the office with Pete, and I'm on call that whole weekend. And um, I sit down with Pete, and I give him my whole testimony. Pete, this is what's happened to me. This is a real deal. You've seen me go through a lot in four years, but I finally found the answer. Jesus is the answer, and I shared my salvation. And Monday morning, I came to work, and my boss asked me to go down to the office with her, to the head nurse, and they fired me. Well, I was kind of ready for it, but not, you know, because like, I'm only three months old in the Lord, and I've got a little baby to take care of. And um, so I go down to the office with the head nurse, and they're going, well, we're going to have to let you go. But see, they had reasons to let me go outside of witnessing, because I was such a drug head. They didn't know it, but I was so, like, I would, like, do drugs, because I would fall asleep during surgery, and they'd have to wake me up. So I had a record of, like, doing things wrong. Or one time I snapped my gum when the eye surgeon was working on and I and was like... So they <laughs> they had legitimate reasons to <laughs> out. Mark, that doesn't do good, does it? No. So I was asked, like they had legitimate reasons for firing me, but that was just the last straw. And so um, you guys, I used to smoke pot, not boasting, but I'd go to work smoking. I'm working in surgery. I mean, I was like a danger to the community. Sad. There's a lot of people out there danger to the communities. But I've been delivered 30 some years now, so don't judge me. But anyway, so, yeah, 35 years I have not touched drugs. I have dreams once in a while, and the enemy wants to make you think you're doing them again, you know. But <laughs> it's whatever. Shelly always teases me. She goes, Mom, the drugs have not left. <laughs> Shelly doesn't know that she used to be in my car when I used to smoke marijuana. Well, she does now. I said, honey, you were a drug addict, too. But <laughs> oh, the things we do. But anyway, so I witnessed to Pete. I come to work, and I have to go down and sit in front of the head nurse. And they're saying that they're going to fire me. And so all confession comes forth. And I'm like, you guys, I am so sorry. I'm such a liar. I go, I lied and said my grandma died, and she didn't die. And I took three days off, and I lied. I mean, I was like, like they were just sitting there going, OK. I was like confessing my sins to these two nurses. <laughs> And, um, you know, just like God is so faithful. So I walked out, and I was devastated. I'm like, I need a cigarette. I need one right now. And so I had only been delivered off smoking for months, maybe. I'm like, I'm going. And so I went to the holiday gas station right by the hospital, and I'm going to buy cigarettes because I'm like, okay, God, I need some help here. The cigarette's going to help me. So like, I, I'm ordering cigarettes, and as I'm standing there, I see a man standing at the back of the store, and he's just standing there like this, and he's looking at me. And literally, you guys, he was standing like this, staring at me. 
And he had a bald head like you, Jason. Serious. <laughs> and I'm just watching him. And I'm looking at him. And I'm like, you know what? Forget it. I don't want cigarettes. And I walked out. And I believe to this day, like at that time, I didn't understand it was an angel. But I believe with all my heart that that man standing there was an angel. And God helped me not submit to the flesh to work my problems out. So long story short, I witness to Pete, I get fired, now I'm a single parent, home with Anna, and have to totally trust God. Shelly, sorry, I always say Anna, sorry Shelly. So, about a month later, I get a call from, a head nurse, from Ella, who was my head nurse, that Pete, who I had witnessed to, had a massive heart attack and died. And you guys, you know what, after I heard that and got that call, I was like, oh my gosh, my job was worth it. My job was worth witnessing to Pete because I didn't know his days were coming to an end. I knew my days were coming to an end. Mark and I were just talking about this, walking around the church praying. Mark's like, Anna, I would be in hell probably 30 years right now. I go, I know I would be too. Because when I got saved, God literally warned me that if I did not surrender, and I didn't, you guys have anybody witnessing to me, I heard this in my mind, not a voice, not an audible voice, that I had to surrender or I was going to go to hell. And I literally started asking from that point on, how do I get saved? How do I get right with God? I need to know because I'm going to die and I'm going to go to hell. So my time, you guys, had I not surrendered, I probably would have been in hell right now for a good 30 years which is sad. And, and that, you know, we don't like to talk about hell because it's like such a horrific place, but the reality is, you guys, the burden for souls when you think about that, that we're talking eternity. And like, I'm just like, God, crying out for the city, God. There are people that don't have Jesus that are going to end up in hell for eternity if they don't hold on to him. And I am like, might as well just throw my notes out. So, the love of God, you guys. <laughs> Okay, he says, draw, and I'll quit. I'll quit in five minutes, Mark, so you can, because we don't want to go too long. He says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice. We are the living sacrifice. We're to be holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service. And he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable. We have to get in the Word, you guys. We have to read the Word. You have to get, you know, it, it's not enough to come to church on Sunday and get a sermon. God wants you in the Word night and day. He wants you as much as you can. Keep your Bible with you wherever you go. Like if you, you know, have time, just get in the Word. Meditate on the Word. Meditate on one scripture. You know, I witnessed to one girl and she said, I can't bring my Bible to work. I said, then get one scripture, write it out, and meditate it on it all day. That's like, you know, 365 scriptures in one year you'd memorize. But, um, so we always, already talked about loving our enemies. He says, your reward will be great. Jesus said that. He said, but love your enemies, do good, lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Our God is kind to the unthankful and the evil. He is kind. We can be kind. We do not, the love of God is what is going to set the captives free. Okay, they already are under so much condemnation. We need to set them free from condemnation. That's our job, is to set them free. It says the light came into the world, but because they love their darkness more than the light, they're condemned. They already are in condemnation. We're trying to take them out of condemnation. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He said, um, and that's a hard one. A lot of us say, well, you know, there's a doctrine going on. God loves me. You know, I can basically do whatever I want. He's still going to love me. But you know what the Bible says, you guys? God's grace is sufficient to deliver you from everything that hinders you from the love of God. So there's no excuse. The Holy Spirit can conquer every sin. There's not one sin that you can't conquer in the Holy Spirit. He says, Jesus said, the one that loves him will keep his word and he will do the word of God. He says, Jesus answered and said to them, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and he will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my word. So you can ask people, do you keep the word of God? Do you believe in the word of God? Do you live by the word of God? 
Because if you say you love God, then you have to live by the word of God. You have to love. And if you can't, and you can't conquer an area, God's love is there to help you get delivered from any sin that hinders you from the love of God. You guys, there's not one sin God can't deliver humanity from. Nothing. It's a lie to believe that you have to continue in that sin. It says, shall you continue in sin that my grace may be, um, abound? He says, God forbid. He said that God's grace is sufficient. Um, you guys, in the last days, there's going to be doctrines of devils, okay? Serious. False prophets, false teachers, and they're going to teach that the grace of God is, is um, licentiousness, you know, sexual, seductive. You know, I can live in my life and still love God. You know, um, um, let's see. Jesus asked Simon Peter, he said, do you love me? And Peter, of course, he said, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, do you love me more than those? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. And I believe Jesus is saying this to us. Do you love me? Melissa, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Steve, do you love me? Feed my sheep. It's not just for pastors. Do you love me? Esther, do you love me? Feed my sheep. We, Mark and I were talking about this, and I want to encourage you, no control, but every one of us, we want to challenge this church that you don't get to find somebody saved. You need to go find somebody not saved and ask if you can spend time with them and start getting them in the Word of God and discipling them. You guys, God doesn't get excited about you sitting in meetings. He really doesn't. He likes you coming to church to be ministered to and to be built up but his heart is out there this is for the church to get built up to get out there and get his prize and so we you guys challenge yourself don't go for the saved oh, I'll disciple somebody that's saved no go for somebody unsaved God give me somebody unsaved show me somebody that I can spend time with once a week make an appointment with them and get together with them and start reading the word do you know why you guys many get into the cult like the Jehovah Witnesses and the Mormons because they take the time to disciple people into seductive gospel, the gospel but Paul said if you teach anything outside of the uh, Jesus Jesus Christ and the Word of God, he said, literally, he said, go to hell. You guys, we've got people out there discipling people into the cults. We need to get out there. And it, really, it's not that hard. Look for one person. Pray for one person. Pray for one human being not saved. I'm challenging you. Nobody that's saved. You can do that too. Find somebody that's saved that needs to get more into the Word. But find somebody that's not saved. And be excited that you get to bring them to the Lord. So he asked Peter the third time, Simon, do you love me? And he goes, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. And sheep are dumb, you guys, and they're wanderers. And it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We can bring them into that green pasture. Um, the Bible says that when you go through trials... In tribulations, it says that it will bring perseverance. Perseverance will pr produce character, and char not to be a character, but character. And character will produce hope, and hope does not disappoint. But the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. God demonstrated his love for us, and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. We all know that. He says, what will separate you from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? Tribulation will come. Is it going to separate you? Focus on the love of God when you go through trials. Distress. Focus on God when you go through distress, or persecution, or famine. Fear. Unbelief. Um, Romans 12, 9 says, let love be without hypocrisy. Do you know what hypocrisy is? It's a play actor. You're a play actor. You play. You pretend you're somebody you're not. God says, love without hypocrisy. He says, be kind. Um, honor one another. Another scripture, he says, esteem others better than yourself. He says, don't slander one another. Don't talk against each other. Don't talk evil against each other. Um, build each other up in, in um, the word of God. He says the kingdom of God is not just in word, but in power. He says knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. 
It says, ever come into, they ever learning, but never come into the end of themselves. Learn, 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 but they're not learning the love of God. They, they, there's a lot of people, Christians too, that have a lot of head knowledge, but they don't know how to love. Remember that guy we showed? He was preaching to everybody, and, and, and then the question was, um, well, how, how do you talk to people? How do you relate? And he goes, oh, I, I can't stand people, <laughs> you know. Okay, you got to love people if you're going to lead them to the Lord. And they'll know if you're being a hypocrite. Um, you know, the love of God, um, we are to abound. It's, it's to abound in love, in your speech, in your knowledge, in diligence, and grace. And then it also talks about waiting, eagerly waiting for the hope of righteousness. Don't get frustrated with yourself. If God is trying to do something in you, don't get frustrated. Wait on him. Allow him to do the work. And I think I'm going to be done because Mark wanted to share too. So I'm sorry I didn't get to all the scriptures on love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You can pray that into your life. You can pray the fruits of the Spirit into your life. Um, it says we are to be holy and without blame before him in love. He says the Holy Spirit will shed abroad in our hearts the love of God. Are you ready, Mark? Oh, he has to go get his computer, so I'll just read a few more until he gets here. He goes, therefore be imitators of God. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God. Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Only what is good and edifying, that it may be in part to the hearers, that grace may be imparted. It says, husbands, love your wives. Pray that your love may abound. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition, but esteem others better than yourself. It says, may the Lord increase and abound in love for one another. If you do a study in love, you'd be amazed how many scriptures you could pray into your life. It says, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. It says, in coming, okay, I won't read that one. Um, God wants us to direct us. It says here, God wants to direct us in the love of God. Now you may, now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts. But we're to go after the love of God. Go after God, you guys. This is eternal. That's not eternal. Right? Are you ready, Mark? Okay. I have about 55 more scriptures I could read. Literally, you guys. Like, there's, like, and I didn't even write all of them out. Love. Love suffers long. It's kind. It does not envy. It is not puffed up. It doesn't parade itself. It doesn't act rudely. It doesn't seek its own. It's not provoked easily. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in sin. Rejoices in truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you left your first love. Jesus said that. He is our first love, you guys. We should have Jesus as our first love. Not our husbands, not our wives, not our work, not our whatever. He should be your first love. There's nothing more important than Jesus. And so, um, Revelation, he says, and many... As I love, I rebuke and chastise. And that's what Clay was talking about. And that was my, one of my last scriptures. That God loves us, he'll chastise us. Because he'll want us to get back lined up into his perfect will for us. So Lord, I just thank you for the freedom. God, I pray for the love of God to be shed abroad in our hearts. God, we can't do it on our own. God, we need you. I ask, Father God, in the name of Jesus, that you do something in each of our hearts, God, to set us free, God. I pray freedom and love in this church, God. Freedom to love one another, God. Freedom to love ourselves, God. You said to love the Lord, that God, with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself, God. Help us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. We care about ourselves, God. We take care of ourselves. We care about where we're going for eternity. God, I pray that we would care about our neighbors, God, and where they're going, God. Open our eyes, God. Open our ears, God. 
God, I pray give us a burden for souls, God. I pray you give us our, your heart, God. Father, you said your business was to do the work of the ministry, to go out and to save those that are lost, God. You said not to be ashamed of the gospel, God. God, you told us not to be ashamed of the gospel, God. God, I pray that you take any fear off of us. You said perfect love casts all fear away, God. Help us not to fear what man can do, God. Help us to be free, God, in you, Jesus, that you are the ultimate reason, God, why we're living, God, and why we do the things we do, God, why we worship, why we come to church. God, we're just so thankful, God. We pray for this community, God. We pray, God, that you set the captives free, God. We're in agreement as a church, God, that you would send a revival, God. Without your spirit, God, nothing will happen, God. And so we are in agreement with you, God, that we want to see. And I pray whatever it takes, God, whatever it takes in this community, God, whatever it takes, God, for families to come to you, God, we agree, God, that you would do something, God, that would bring them to knowing you, God, for eternity, God, in Jesus' name.